Hello. How is everybody? I missed you. Uh, we are studying today session 14, which is chapter 5, verse 9 of the Song of Solomon. So I think we'll just jump right in and let's start with prayer. Father, I thank you that you are our God and that you desire that we know you and become close and intimate with you. And you've given us your word to teach us, to enlighten us, and to show us your ways. But I just ask you, Father, that it not just be an intellectual teaching, but that it be an experience with you, an experiential knowledge of who you are, Jesus. And I pray especially for today that you will solidify within us, in our body, soul, and spirit, who you really are, that you will pull down all false teachings and anything that has led us to believe wrong thoughts and feelings about you. And you will reveal yourself to all who hear this teaching and study your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as is become tradition now, I'm going to read from the message. We're going to start with chapter 5, verse 9. And this is what they call the chorus, speaking first. What's so great about your lover, fair lady? What's so special about him that you beg for our health? And the woman answers, My dear lover glows with health, red-blooded and radiant. He's one in a million. There's no one quite like him. My golden one, pure and untarnished, with raven-black curls tumbling across his shoulders. His eyes are like doves, soft and bright, but deep-set, brimming with meaning like wells of water. His face is rugged. His beard smells like sage. His voice, his words, warm and reassuring. Fine muscles ripple beneath his skin, quiet and beautiful. His torso is the work of a sculptor, hard and smooth as ivory. He stands tall like a cedar, strong and deep-rooted, a rugged mountain of a man, aromatic with wood and stone. His words are kisses, his kisses words. Everything about him delights me, thrills me through and through. That's my lover, that's my man, dear Jerusalem, sisters. <laughs> So today, as you can see, we're talking about Jesus. But before we get into the description of who he is, I want us to look at this twofold test. Excuse me while I raise my stand a little bit here so I can see it better. Hold on, guys. <laughs> I want us to talk about this twofold test that the uh, Shulamite has been through. It strengthens her, this divine testing. Now, remember last time we talked about how she was lovesick for him, how she had been obedient to him, and how he withdrew. That was the test, that she had been perfect in her obedience to the Lord, and yet he withdrew his manifest presence from her. It was very disappointing, extremely disappointing for the bride. It's very disappointing in the natural and in the spiritual. And what this divine testing is doing for her and for us, when we feel this withdrawing of the Lord and we have not been disobedient or sinful, but we've been obedient, is this divine testing is strengthening and purifying us. Meditating on the Word of God is what trains us for martyrdom. In this season of life, as we meditate on the Song of Solomon, it's actually training us for martyrdom. Now, now, what does that mean? That is a phrase that the Lord has given me years ago. We are literally being trained in sacrifice and ministry and persecution for Him. We are learning the lessons of abiding in the unknowing the uncomfortableness of God, and yet still being 100% in love with Him, 100% lovesick for Him. And these tests, they, they actually reveal our deepest motives and desires. They reveal her to motive was for service, was to please Him. It revealed in her this desire to please Him more than herself, more than anybody else. And that's the fruit that He's trying to produce in His bride at this time. 
And the amazing thing about it is the, the way that the lukewarm respond to her. You know, if you've ever tried to witness or minister to anybody, I think the hardest person to reach is what we call the lukewarm. They're very satisfied with where they are. They know Christ. They're saved. They're in the kingdom of God. But that's it. I just say they got their toes stuck in. And they're not even interested really in going deep. And they're lukewarm. They're, they're not hot. They're not cold. And as the Revelation chapter 3 tells us about the church at Laodicea, it says that Jesus will vomit these out of his mouth. They really make him sick, basically. <laughs> So in the song, this lukewarm group is called the Daughters of Jerusalem. And the way that they respond to her severe and divine testing is something we need to take notice of. So first, her first answer to the Lord is the beauty of the Lord. And her second is her instruction to the daughters. So now let's look at that in a little more. In the midst of this severe testing... The bride gives one of the most extravagant human love responses in all of the scripture. After Jesus breaks the silence, he gives one of the most extravagant divine love responses in the scripture, and that will be in chapter 6. But I think the wonderful part of this is in her response is there's no offense. Instead of being offended with God, she responds as a lovesick bride. She describes the majestic splendor of Jesus Christ. It reminds me of the uh, Gentile woman who came to Jesus and he said, you know, I'm here for the Jews, basically. And she responded, but Lord, Lord, but Jesus, even the dogs can gather the crumbs from under the table. She went in humility, and she got her prayer answered. So instead of being offended, which you would imagine if you've done everything right, and most of us have been here, if you've prayed every right prayer, if you've sacrificed everything you could sacrifice, if you've you know, humbled yourself, repented from all your sins, whatever list of achievements that you think makes you perfect for God, <laughs> which is a falsehood in itself, after you've done all these things and your prayers are still not answered or you can't feel his presence, the normal human response is, well, pff, I tried that, it didn't work. Or I'm offended, you know, I don't want you anymore. But he, as I have taught you, has crafted her response to bring her to this mature state so that instead of being offended, she responds as a lovesick bride and she starts describing the majesty of God. And we have this beautiful passage here where in verse 10, chapter 5, she starts describing, My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000 men. Her response is one of adoration and worship, not offense. We're going to look at every one of those imageries and symbols in just a few minutes. But first we're going to look at... Song of Songs 9, when the daughters say, What is your beloved more than another beloved? O fairest, most beautiful among women, what is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? They're dumbfounded by it. They're, now these daughters are superficial, soulish, carnal believers. Okay, yeah, Everybody can probably think of somebody like that, and you've probably been that way yourself in the past at times. The first thing that comes out of them after she's been beat up by the watchman and thrown out and her reputation is destroyed is out of her deep humility, they go, what, what, what is this man? Who is this man that you would go through all this for him? The spiritually dull and passive daughters of Jerusalem ask the bride this question. They have several questions, but it provokes them what provokes them is the bride's deep love for Jesus more than her wisdom and giftedness. Now think of that. If you're trying to witness to others, it's not your wisdom or your giftedness that will reach them, but it's your deep, passionate love for Jesus himself. 
This was what captivated them. This was the response. The first five chapters of the book, she couldn't get them to listen to her. And now all of a sudden in her darkest, most alone time, when she feels defeated, she pours out this adoration of worship to the Lord and that awakens the dull and passive believers. It's amazing. She says, um, the daughters ask her and she says, tell him I'm lovesick. Help me find him. They didn't say to her, you're so wise and anointed, you know. But they said, what is he? Who is he? Who is this beloved more than any other beloved? What they saw was the lovesick heart that adorned her and made her beautiful. It makes her gorgeous. This adorned heart. It draws people to you. <laughs> we are adorned and made beautiful by love, even more than wisdom or power. It's love sickness, love sickness that they saw in her and that they will see in us that will make us beautiful and cause them to ask you. I mean, every missionary and minister and witness and evangelist, evangelist loves this question. Won't you tell me about Jesus? Or... Who is this man, Jesus? I mean, we live for that question. Well, if you want to produce the fruit of evangelism in your life, then become a lovesick worshiper. Become a lovesick worshiper. They say, what's the deal? You know, what do you know that we don't know? Become lovesick for him, and it will draw the lost and the lukewarm to you to witness to them. They're a little taken back, okay, by her earnestness. Just a little bit taken back by her. They saw Jesus, okay? They knew him. They were believers. They saw him as the one she loved insatiably. They're perplexed and they're amazed at her response of being lovesick. And they saw her affections for Jesus and concluded she must know something that they don't know. You know, most people who are hurt, they write the church off. They just write it off. But she actually goes to the immature believers to be taught by them. She's literally humbling herself in her lovesickness. And she's, you know, desperate for him. She's desperate in lovesickness. And she'll go to anybody. Well, the watchmen have thrown her out and wounded her, the leaders of the church. But these immature believers, she's even going, you know, have you seen him? Have you seen him? And this is what woos the people to God. It's a Mary of Bethany type love where she's just at his feet adoring him. It's the lovesick worshiper. She's restored the first commandment to its first place. And this is the response she got, an unusual response. She wasn't expecting it. She had humbled herself, but she got, how can you be so devoted to him when he seemingly treated you so harshly? How can you? Tell us the secret. We follow him, but not the way you do. And he withheld his manifest presence from you. He allowed you to be kicked out of the church. Why, in heaven's name, are you so tenaciously loyal? What do you know about him that we don't know that has led you to joyfully give all for him? They don't understand this kind of dedication. They can't grasp it. They know who he is as Savior but they don't know him intimately and personally and experientially face to face with God. They do really want to know the answer. They want to know. This question is a beginning of fervency and awakening in the daughters. As they see the spiritual reality in the bride of lovesickness, they become attracted to this, drawn to it, wooed by the Holy Spirit. You know, it reminds me of the Bible talking about the Jewish people and how Christians will provoke them to jealousy. Well, how are you going to provoke someone to jealousy and love sickness if you yourself are not in a deep relationship with the Lord? No one's going to be jealous over a lukewarm romance, I can promise you. But lovesick worshipers have more power to draw the unbeliever than wisdom and spiritual giftedness 
They have more power than anything to be lovesick. That's what draws people. Now, it's interesting that they didn't ask who he was. They asked what. What is your beloved? You know, they already knew him. Many people are saved, but they didn't know this majestic splendor. They didn't know this side of him. And it says in the next part of the verse, what is your beloved more than another beloved? All right, let's look at that. Other beloveds. People have other lovers, other things in their life, other people in their life, other ambitions, other goals, other lovers. And the daughters had other beloveds in their lives. Ahead of the Lord Jesus is the key. You know, such things as money, pleasure, prominence, fame, the comfort zone, they actually loved these things more than they loved the Lord. Though they were sincerely saved. They were sincerely saved. You know, some even loved the anointing and ministry more than they loved Jesus. Ministry, prestige, and crowds more than they love Him. I want you to think about that for a minute. Because this is a very hard place in Christianity that we don't quite grasp. Jesus was really serious when he said, return to me as your first love. He said, the greatest of all the commandments was to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, to love your neighbor as yourself. The second implies ministry as well. But the first commandment, is to, our goal is to make the Lord prominent. He is the prominent beloved in our life, but he's not necessarily the only one. You know, the Lord, he doesn't mind if we have other people and things in our lives, but he wants to be first. He wants to be first. He wants the first commandment to be in the first place. Very important to him. Now, we're going to look up another Bible verse in 1 Corinthians 7.29. All right. Through 31. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none, those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. The form of this world is passing away. You know, Paul taught about denying these acceptable privileges. There's nothing wrong with them. But to go after deeper pleasures, spiritual pleasures, to go after with fervency in an undistracted devotion and service to the Lord. Undistracted devotion and service to the Lord. That is not easy to accomplish in this world. But think about all the distractions in our lives. The enemy of our souls will send distractions to us. It will break things in our house. It will cause people to have problems, to constantly be like gnats flying around you to distract you. You actually have to fight for your time alone with God. And then you have to fight your own mind, focusing on just Him and not your problems and not your wants list and not your prayer list and not all the people. It is a fight to discipline yourself to have undistracted devotion. And I encourage you that that's what the Song of Solomon is about. He's teaching us all the way how to be mature, to work towards that undistracted devotion, to enter into wholeheartedness with Him. That is the mature bride. It's an uh, invasive, offensive message to many. It touches the thought life, the sex life, our time. It reaches right in and grabs the heart. It grabs us right where we live every day. This message, it demands wholehearted response. As you can say, many say it draws a line in the sand. Who's for me and who's against me? Who's with me? What is this beloved more than any other? Well, we're going to find out in a minute. And the deep respect that the daughters have for her, she says, they say, oh, fairest among women. They recognized her as being someone different than they were. She was more beautiful spiritually. She, she walked in a depth, and it's often translated most beautiful, not just fairest. But we see this deep respect that they had for her. They see her as the most beautiful. 
they see her as beautiful in devotion and in godliness and in purity in stark contrast to the watchmen that we just talked about those who were the Saul type they can't see the beauty in the heart of King David they, they couldn't see the anointing you know David used to come and he play worship and the evil spirit would lift off of Saul well they recognized something's different but it didn't provoke in them adoration it provoked in them jealousy Saul became mad and jealous at David and that's what happens in these type of Saul type watchmen but her life gave off a fragrant aroma of the knowledge of God it was emanating from the bride to create this hunger from one group the daughters and offense in the other group the watchmen does that remind you of a Bible verse anybody it says that we are the fragrance of life to life and death to death to some the fragrance of life to others the fragrance of death and it is the same Holy Spirit that gives a fragrance his fragrance off in us and to some it produces life they're attracted to you they're drawn to you I've got to know what you've got I've got to have it and others it repels them because it's not about you or the fragrance it's about their response to the fragrance and some will become jealous and angry and hate you for the very fragrance others are attracted to you for. I think it's very important that we realize this when we start ministering to others because you don't deserve the credit you get and you don't deserve the flag that you get. Either one. Now that's if you're walking right with God. Some people may really deserve the flag <laughs> if they've been sinful, rotten, obnoxious, you know, bad-mouthing people. But um, for the average person that's walking in the Holy Spirit and abiding in Christ, you don't deserve the flack that comes at you, the anger and the, the strange things where people lash out at you for no reason. That's them lashing out at God in you. And you don't deserve the hero worship and the, the falling at your feet fame. You know, the book of Revelation said, the angel said, rise up, don't kneel to me. Really, only bow down to the living God. And we don't deserve either one. And you need to understand your place in that. You are just the available vessel. Now, ultimately, false accusations against the godly do not impact sincere members of the body over time. You know, when the watchmen are falsely accusing the bride. Um, the immature believer will actually see the maturity and the godly virtue even easier than the watchmen do. And they don't receive the accusations of the jealous watchmen about the bride. They will see even more clearly than the watchmen do at times. These new believers, they have a sincerity and they have an open spirit. And sometimes the older believers can become bitter and jealous leaders. So keep that in mind. That's probably one of the reasons she went to the daughters in humility and said, Have you seen him? Even though they were immature, they had an open spirit and they didn't have all that harsh evil jealous bitterness in their their spirit and they had not wounded her and kicked her out the daughters now uh, they can see the reality of God in her and they can see it directly in their meditation of the scriptures so this is something that they can see the young believer through the reality in Christ can grow in this area through the scriptures and they can see this reality but they haven't yet attained the ability to experience it yet because they're still in chapter one kiss me with the kisses of your word O Lord you are better than one but everything's about them and not about him so it's this humility that is a very precious gift that God produces in the believer that causes the immature believer to come to you and want to know about Christ. It is that humility that the mature bride um, cherishes and God cherishes in us. Now let's look at the next part of the verse. He said, What is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women, women that you charge, that you so charge us? Why do you so charge us to find him? You know, they had never seen such maturity and humility. And she, she had an unusual, an unusual, teachable spirit. A lot of people don't have teachable spirits. They buck up at any time you say something. They, they, you know, 
no, no, no. There's this no in their spirit or this silent, yeah, tell me what you want, but I'm going to believe what I want anyway. They don't have teachable spirits. And this is vital for relationships, not only with each other, but with God. And the mature can actually receive from the immature without any spirit of pride. That's one of the symptoms of walking in maturity is you can receive ministry from those less mature than you. Whereas pride won't. Pride will buck up against it. And they said, what is it that you charge us so? All right, now we're moving into the next section, which actually is my favorite part of the whole book. And her first answer to what is your beloved is chapter 5, verse 10. It's the majestic splendor of Jesus. It's one of the most powerful descriptions of Jesus and one of the most outstanding expressions of worship in the Word of God. This is the one time in the song where she pours out her worship to the King. It's a magnificent, poetic unveiling of the splendor of Christ Jesus. The knowledge of these ten attributes, it brings a stability in the midst of the storms of our life, in the dark night of the soul that we go through. And she's given us the key of what she understood and why she could be lovesick when everything is going wrong. I suggest to you that you take long, lingering moments to ponder chapter 5, verses 10 through 16. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is who He is. This is who God is. And the Holy Spirit uses these metaphors of the human body to convey these ten attributes of God's personality. And they seem strange. They're poetic, right? But they're beautiful. They focus on Him and His majesty. And instead of being preoccupied with her and her own desires and pressures from the test that she's currently going through or the ones in the past, you know, a lovesick person is quiet. They are compelled to see through it. Job was compelled to see through it in his misery and started declaring God the creator of all. And who was he to argue with the Lord? So let's start in. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. My beloved is white. Each phrase is so precious to me. You know, when I sing with my harp, and I do prophetic worship, this is what I always go to. Song of Songs 510. My beloved is white. He is radiant. He is dazzling. He is bright. He is white. He is fully God, fully divine in all he is. He's fully divine. And my beloved is ruddy. My God is fully man ruddy like red clay. He is made in God's image like us. He was born of a woman. He is fully God and he is fully man. And he's chief among 10,000 men. You know, he's incomparably superior to all people, all pleasures, all experiences in this fallen world. He is the chief, you know, he is the CEO, he is the one, the only one. He is the superior among the whole human race. He is that he is. He is superlative in his beauty. He is sovereign leadership overall. It says his head is like the finest gold. You know, gold it represents divinity. His head is like the finest gold. It speaks of his, his sovereignty, his headship over all creation. And I don't use the word headship often, but when I'm speaking of Jesus, he is head. He is my head. Head over all that ever was, all that ever will be, all that is now. The finest gold, not just gold, but the finest gold. The divine of the divine. He speaks of the highest degree of quality and excellence. It's the finest of the finest metal and jewels and everything that the world or beyond has to offer. He is the finest. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. 
Now, this is an unusual passage, but you just have to see Solomon, and you have to think of Samson, I mean, Samson in this passage. He had the long, wavy locks, and when his hair was cut, his strength was diminished. So the long hair, it speaks of dedication. It speaks of sacrificial dedication to the Lord, like the Nazarite vow. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. It, um, it's a beautiful vow of dedication that Jesus has, the Nazarite vow, which forbid, you know, as I said, people from cutting their hair. And it's wavy, it's bushy. The thick wavy hair is the hair of a young man in the prime of his life. In contrast to an old man with thinning hair, it's lost vitality and fullness, not Jesus. His dedication is not weak, it's not lacking in strength or in vitality. And he does not grow weary in his dedication to us and to the Father. He does not grow weary at all. So his locks are long and they're wavy and they're black as a raven. You know, black, it speaks of youthfulness, energetic zeal. Black hair is contrast to the gray hair of an old man. His consecration to God is eternally vigorous. You know, that's amazing that you can get all of that out of that little phrase. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. You see, this poetry is of the Song of Solomon is rich in symbolism. So it speaks of his great dedication. Now let's look at the next phrase. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of water. Waters washed with milk and fitly set in... Um, 512 his omniscience his infinite knowledge his all-knowing wisdom understanding and discernment his eyes speak of his ability to see beyond the temporal he can see with a supernatural wisdom and understanding he has a discernment that are like doves by the rivers of water his eyes are like doves. You know, this speaks once again of his singleness of mind and his singleness of vision. He's focused on his bride in purity. But there's more than that. He, he's all-knowing, infinite in knowledge and wisdom. God sees the heart when man looks on the outward appearance. God has a purity in his knowledge that only he can have. We cannot discern and judge others because we don't know the back story. But he does. He can see past, present, future, and what even hasn't ever been thought of happening, as many sci-fi fans like to say. He can see interdimensionally what may have been, what could have been, what happened, what will happen. He can see eternally in this great wisdom and understanding. So his eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. It speaks of the purity being washed in the river of God, having no sin, having no evil in his eyes and his thoughts. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, like banks of scented herbs. Well, now cheeks, they often speak of your emotions. When you blush, you know, you have little red cheeks. Well, God has diverse emotional makeup, and many people don't realize this about the Lord. But here it says his cheeks are like a bed of spices, like banks of scented herbs, multiple emotions, multiple spices, multiple herbs, his passions and his pleasures. His cheeks reflect the countenance of his face, his passions, his pleasures, his emotional makeup. They are the windows to the emotions which enable us to discern whether a person has joy or sadness or anger. So you can see everything in a person's eyes and in his cheeks. Now, his garden is filled with delightful fragrances. And I heard this week the scripture that we uh, quote a lot about, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and delightful that we've left that delightful out in many translations. I, the Lord's burdens, which she's in right now, a season of burden, are light and delightful. Okay? Well, that gives you a clue. If you're burdened by something that's not light and delightful, it's probably not God. Okay? Now, 
So we can discern his emotions, his emotional life. is like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. They speak of the extravagant amount of diversity of fragrance in his affections. All these herbs and all these different fragrance and, and culinary ability to use these herbs and medicinal properties that come out of them. His emotions are like various diverse flora and fauna and the spices that are ground and you grind them to get the fragrance out of it. It speaks of the cross of Christ and how this has been cultivated in him. He is a beautiful, emotional God-man. And I say that because many men in the past in history have been taught not to cry, not to have emotions. Well, that is totally against God. He created all humans with an emotional makeup. And whether we are healed emotionally or not, that's another story. But to be like Christ, in purity and in strength, we have all the emotions just like Him. And many diverse kinds. Uh, I want to speak of right now this um, part about Jesus. A little personal story. One day, um, the Lord asked me. He said, do you believe that I have a greater capacity to love than humans do? And I said, well, yes, of course I do. You're God. You can love a lot better than we can. And then he said, then why don't people believe that I have a greater capacity to hurt than they do? As if he was saying, whatever emotions humans experience, his is multiplied times a tenth to the tenth power or more. He experiences these emotions. He's just fully in control of his emotions. He has the ability to be angry at evil, but not to be angry at what is good. He's not sinful in his anger. He hates what is evil, and he loves what is good. That is a godly attribute. But he also hurts deeply when we hurt him. God is a very um, deeply emotional God. He's not out there like a deist God without any emotion. He set the world into being and he left you to, you know, work it out on your own. That That's not the God that we serve. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not our Lord Jesus. All right, the next phrase. His lips are lilies dripping with liquid myrrh. His lips, the power of his word. His lips speak of his words. Now the mouth it kisses you in intimacy, but the lips, they speak the word of God. His words are sweet and pure like lilies. Jesus' words contain myrrh, which speaks of his exhortation to embrace the death to self. Myrrh was the spice that they anointed people in burial. It was a spice that he was anointed in. It's often the prophetic spice. They brought to the baby Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which speaks of king, priest, and prophet. So it's a prophetic anointing to suffer, to go to the cross. And his lips, like the lilies, like lilies are fragrant. Um, Jesus said, see, see the lilies of the field, they're arrayed in all their beauty. And even Solomon in all his glory was not dressed and arrayed like these. It speaks of carefreeness. It speaks of prosperity. It speaks of his lips speak wonderful blessings over our lives. And we are the lilies of the valley, the rose of Sharon. His lips are like us. We're made in his image. And dripping with this liquid myrrh, he's dripping with humility because he's walked through it. He's our high priest. He's not just some God sitting on a high place and looking down, lording things over us where he can't relate to us. No, his lips drip with liquid myrrh in humility. His hands are rods of gold and set with beryl. This speaks of his divine activity. His hands and his arms, rods of gold, rods of divinity. His works, his activities, not only his thoughts are divine, but his works and his activities are gold. He has total power. He's omnipotent. And he accomplishes everything that he pleases. It says that the word of God goes out and will not return void. And it accomplishes that which God pleases. Well, so do his works. His works go out and they accomplish it. It's this divine character in accomplishing his work. It's not just haphazard. 
God has a plan. And he is a divine activity in the grand scheme of things. Like I said, past, present, and future. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the universe, in the beautiful galaxies, and, and the unknown of creation that we haven't even discovered yet. As well as deep within the heart of each individual person, he numbers the hairs on our head. He is divinely in charge of all that is going on. He is not a God that has left you alone. He said, I will go. And it is better for you that I go because I leave you the comforter, the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. And he's with you, but he will be in you. He's not alone. It says the word of God is closer to you than your very breath that you breathe, closer in your heart. This is our God. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. Carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. It speaks of his tender compassion. It translates his body as his belly. You know, this speaks of his tender compassion. Often people use the phrase, the bowels of compassion. They feel deeply to the point of groaning in their inner man. My heart yearned for the word. It yearned. It's translate belly. It's deep feelings of tender compassion. His body is carved and inlaid with this bright ivory, this polished ivory. It's clean. It's white. It's expensive and it's rare. His compassion and patience are described as rare like ivory. So he's yearning for his people. They're like carved ivory. They're so rare and so beautiful that it's like, you know, the David statue. Or it's like the Milo, Venus de Milo. Or, or have you seen that beautiful carved statue where she has the, the veil over her face and it's made of marble. It's like, how could they even create something so beautiful as that? How could Michelangelo do that? Well, I loved what he said. He said, I just look at a big old chunk of marble. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Mm -hmm. And I chip away everything that's not the statue. You know, the Lord does that. He sees the beauty and the creation in us, and then he chips away the stuff that's not him, the stuff that's not perfect, the dross in our lives. Mm -hmm. And he's already carved ivory. He's already beautiful. He's already like that, a man of great tender compassion. And it's inlaid with sapphires. You know, it's like beautiful blue sparkling sapphires like the stars of heaven. It's just so beautiful. The body of the Lord. And I believe it's what he wants us to be. We are the body of Christ. We are supposed to be tender with compassion. I'm reminded of the scripture that says. A multitude came to him. And he looked at them as sheep without a shepherd. And he yearned. He had compassion on them. And he healed them all of all their sicknesses and diseases. It's the compassionate nature of God that motivates him to bring healing in our bodies and healing in our lives. It's not that he owes us anything, but it's his great compassion for broken people who've been left alone without leaders and shepherds and about anybody to take care of them, and he's moved deeply by that. It says true religion is ministry to widows and orphans mm -hmm. in the Bible. The next phrase says, His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His legs, his walk, and the administration and his purposes as he's walking. You know, we have a walk. We walk in this world. Well, his walk here is symbolic of the way in which he fulfills his purpose. It's the administration of how he proceeds forth with his sovereign will. His legs are like pillars of marble. His will is strong. There's strength. There's orderliness. And yet there's beauty. It was marble, not just oak trees, but marble, strong, permanent type of building material. It points that God's ways are not only strong, but lovely, permanent, established, and orderly, carved like gold, these pillars of strength and orderliness. It's beautiful the way God the scripture teaches us about his character and who he is. He's not a fly-by-night God. He's strength and he's orderly in his plans for our lives. The next phrase says, His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. 
Well, this is his impartation to his people. Okay, countenance. It speaks of his impartation to his people. Like David prayed, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. The prayer that the Lord would intervene by imparting the discernible manifestations of himself to his people. His countenance comes upon you. His presence comes upon you. The countenance of God shining on us means that God imparts his manifest favor to us and on us. Woo, let's pray for that. Lord, let your countenance shine upon us. We need that favor and that manifest presence that we're all longing for. And no more than this girl in this season when she can't feel him. She's declaring your countenance. Oh, your countenance. How wonderful your favor is to me. How wonderful your presence is to me. When she can't feel it. When she can't see it or discern it. It's like Lebanon. It's, it's a symbol of this glorious, stately, pleasing, and honorable place. You know, Lebanon, I've said before, used to be the vacation home of those in Israel. It's cooler, it's north, it's got waters, it's clear, it's, it's got the cedar trees that purify the air. I'm sure it was a lovely place at one time. Now it's sort of in rubble. But glorious, stately, pleasing, and honorable is his countenance. It's excellent as the cedars. It's excellent countenance, great favor, and, and not cheap. One of my pet peeves, and I'm just going to tell you right now. When you go into the church kitchen, now this is coming from an old pastor's wife, and you pull out the kitchen drawer, and you see the pots and pans and the utensils, and it's everybody's old leftover beat up, kind of thing that they had left or that they would have thrown away from a yard sale that they've donated to the church. That's not excellence. That's not giving your best to God. And that's one of my pet peeves. Go buy new things and keep your old stuff. Give the new ones to the church. <laughs> okay. That's just my opinion. That's not scriptural. <laughs> okay. It's truthful. It's truthful, though. It is truthful. Okay. <laughs> so, um... Now, the next phrase, his mouth, oh, is most sweet. His sweetest kisses I've ever known have come from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. His mouth, it speaks of the communication of intimacy as in the kisses of his mouth. It's not just the lips, it's the mouth, the kisses of his mouth. Is distinct from his words, which are represented as lips. We talked about that a minute ago. But intimacy, deep intimacy, is the vehicle of kissing. It speaks of the kisses of the mouth of intimacy. Now, don't get caught up in fleshly ideas. But this is an imagery that God's mouth is most sweet. His intimacy to my soul is the sweetest kiss I've ever received. It's come from him. Nothing delights her soul more than intimacy with him. She has made him the first commandment in her life. Okay? So that means that he is her first love. He's everything to her. He is the most beautiful, blessed kiss that she could receive. There, there is no other man or woman that could kiss her heart like he does. He is chief among 10,000 men. Even in chapter 2, she said he's like an apple tree among the green forest. You know, he's something special, something other than. And there's nobody can do you like Jesus. I'm telling you, nobody can do you like Jesus. <laughs> oh, that's the truth. You know, and even the remembrance, for her it's a remembrance of the intimacy it's, it's enough to sustain her through the north winds. Just the remembrance of the intimacy. Now that is a moment. That's what I call, we call an encounter with God. He kissed her, baby. She'll never forget that kiss. Mm -hmm. How many of you will forget your first kiss? It probably wasn't that great from a little boy or girl, but it was the first one, you know. Well, you'll never forget the kisses of Jesus. You can't journal about it enough. You can't forget it. You can never, all eternity, you'll be reminded of that sweet kiss of God in your heart, in your mind, in your life. Oh, kiss me. Kiss me with the kisses of your word, oh God. That's my default. Whenever I need Jesus and I'm in this state, chapter 1, verse 1, 
Kiss me with the kisses of your word, O oh Lord, for your love is better than wine, better than anything the world has to offer. I push control alt delete I start over and I go right back to song of song one that's my default button okay I must have missed I missed it I don't understand where I am but I know this his kisses are sweet <laughs> go back there if you have to start over start over now the next thing she says is he is all together lovely I love that all together not just lovely all together lovely it's depicted by the religious world is so different than how she depicts him. I mean, the religious world just doesn't know him personally. They know about him. They've read the books. They've read the history. They've seen the icons, but they don't know him. But she does. He's altogether lovely. I will never draw back from him. You know, this is a kind of holy abandonment that God will use to awaken the body of Christ in the earth. I mean, holy abandonment to God. And all I can say is, if I die, I die. Holy abandonment to the Lord God. I, it's not because He gave you a car. My gosh, get over yourself. It's because He kissed you like no one has ever kissed you before. You would die for him. Everybody, the whole world can go to hell in a handbag, but you will never deny your Christ. That's the lovesick worshiper. They can mock you. They can say you're one of those weird holy rollers. They can say, look at you. You spent too much money on watches and clothes, blah, blah, blah. And yet at the same time, all they're doing is praying for more money and prosperity. They can do everything they can say, everything negative they can think of, but they will never Take the fire of the lovesick worshiper out of a lovesick worshiper's heart. They will go to the cross willingly and readily. If all someone says is deny Christ, they will say never. That's the martyred heart. That's the lovesick worshiper. Is the heart of a martyr. And God is training us for martyrdom. I know it sounds tough. But I'm telling you, he's so worked that in me that if I don't get to be martyred, I'll be so upset. I've been through all this and I don't get the crown. Oh, God have mercy. That's the, the fire he puts in you. There's no fear. The only fear I have is standing before the Lord and not having a crown to throw at his feet. That's a whole different motivation than I'm going to raise a little money and go out and preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good too, but you know what I mean. So, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, she says, and this is my friend. Just reading it is getting to me because I prayed this so many times when I was so down and I was so unknowing and confused. I went, no, I don't care what you say. He would never do that to his bride. This is my beloved. This is my friend. She's filled with love and adoration for him as her friend, too. You know, he's not just her lover. He's her friend. You know, he, he, he's he got great passion and, and urgency and feeling. There's all this deep feeling, but he's her best friend. He's got her back. He knows her heart. He knows all her weaknesses. He knows all the stupid things she's ever said and done. She, he knows the pits of dark mud that she fell in willingly sometimes and he still says even in your weakness you are lovely to me he sees the yes in our hearts if there's one message in the song of solomon it's that he loves weak and broken people and he's doing it for you he's doing it for you the cross is all about god doing it for you and he is so worthy he is so lovely he is your friend he is your best friend and then she cries out oh daughters of jerusalem if you only knew you know there's no condemnation in or, or accusation in her approach to the daughter she's not coming from a level of pride or a saul spirit she uses Jesus himself to capture them rather than rebuking them. Her method is to reveal Jesus to them, not to say, you're so far away from him, you'll never know this great God. 
Oh my Lord, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of the accuser. Repentance, I want to say, is of God. But it's His kindness which leads us to repentance. Whenever I've been in a good old hellfire and damnation sermon, and I'll say Steve Hill at the Brownsville Revival was one of the great saints of God. Boy, could he preach a sermon. And he would tell it like it was. You can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping off your face, he would say. <laughs> and you can sing in the choir your whole life and still end up in hell. You know, he was preaching hard. But whenever he preached, I felt so loved. Oh, I would sit there like a little girl and I'd be going, that's right. Oh, thank you for telling me. I didn't know I was lost. That's the way I felt. There was no judgment in my spirit. There was no, well, let me see what he has to say now if I'm going down or not. I don't know. Oh, Uncle Joe is watching. There was none of that in my spirit because a true evangelist has an anointing. You're grateful that someone's rescuing you from this pit that you're about to fall in or have already fallen in. If you're drowning in the deep ocean, you're lucky and you're blessed that someone's throwing you a life raft or a, a, one of those life preservers. You grab hold of that thing. You know, it's, it's a different understanding of our God. He's a rescuer of the broken and the weak people. That's our God. And she's trying to inspire them in the midst of her great darkness, in her struggle. It actually produces in her a tenderness. Towards the lost. And not a pharisaical attitude. Oh daughters of Jerusalem. You know Jesus. I mean John the Baptist. Said about Jesus. He said I must decrease. That he might increase. We want to get to the decreasing. But we want Jesus to be the one that's increasing. It automatically. As Jesus increases in you. It makes everything else around you dim. Now, I know I'm telling a few personal stories today, but these were profound moments in my life that were supernatural that I want all of you to understand. Uh, this is a reality. It's rare, but these things happen. So I was at an Episcopal church in Shreveport, and we had a doctor, a medical doctor, who was known for rebuilding the hands of lepers and people. You know, there's thousands of bones in the hands and the feet, and they're because of the disease, they're... Uh, limbs fall off and he was um, a supernatural man of God that was known for praying over his people in surgery and being able to literally rebuild hands and fingers and toes and he is a miraculous man in himself so he came well I'm like, oh I gotta meet this man you know <laughs> so we go to church and it's just a little Friday night prayer and praise service and this little five foot six or eight man gets up there and he's gray headed and he's small and and he's kind of well i'm gonna say meek because i don't want to insult him <laughs> but he's kind of wimpy looking in my opinion now, i wasn't real mature back in the 80s but i just remember sitting there listening to him talk and he'd written a couple of books fearfully and wonderfully made profound books about god and medicine and i'm sitting there thinking this is the great saint of god you know, and uh, I thought well, I had my mother with me, and I remember thinking, well, I'll be nice, you know, and I'll go over and tell him, thank you for coming, we appreciate you coming, and I shook his hand, and when I touched his hand, as God is my witness, it was everything in me not to fall to the floor and bow and put my nose to his shoes. I'm not kidding. I had, I don't know, inner, outer, I don't know, but I had a flash of the Lord Jesus Christ in His glory, in His kingship, standing before me. There was that little man there, but whoom, right in front of me was such a powerful image of God in Him that that little man disappeared, and all I saw was Jesus. And I had this uncontrollable desire. I actually grabbed my mother and hung on to her like I was going to fall because I really was so compelled to just fall at my feet and just go, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, Lord. Forgive me for everything. Forgive me for all my sins. I mean, it was just this gut-wrenching repentance that was just produced in me the minute he touched my hand. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I was struck dumb. I, I, I mean, I could speak, but I didn't speak. I, the fear of God. Oh, my goodness. And my mother, I don't know that she experienced anything. 
It was just a moment that God was showing me, this is one of my chosen saints. And I felt love. In the repentance, I felt the love that overwhelmed me to the point, it was the love that wanted, made me fall on my face. It's, it's really hard for me to explain because there wasn't a verbal communication. It was just, whoom, I was just in the presence of the, the living God that walked in this man. So later, I'm praying, and I'm like, Lord, what in the world? I was overwhelmed with, God, can you get me to that place? Lord, and I was a daughter of Jerusalem then, obviously. And I, what is it about him? I want what he's got. And the Lord was like, really? And he said, you know, people like Paul Brand and Mother Teresa have that. And he said, but they gave everything up for it. They have no reputation. They have no money. They have no outward appearance. They're not beautiful people. They can't speak well. He said, to walk in that, you have to be so willing to die to self that I increase in you and you decrease into nothingness. That is the only way you can walk in that. I am bigger in you than you are in me and I just humbled myself before the Lord and I said Lord if it's possible <laughs> you know I'm willing well that is a very hard prayer to pray because then you spend a lifetime of living a life of no reputation and in our world especially in ministry reputation is everything I've even heard Dr. Um, um, not Dr. Paul Brand that was the man but I've heard um, other great prophets of God Paul, wasn't it Paul Brand? What was his name? Anyway, named Paul. And he um, talked about how that the Lord will tell him to go on the platform and speak nonsense. And he always said, I want you to make yourself look stupid and of no, and he says it's happened to him so many times. And then during the ministry time, the gold dust will fall, the miracles will happen, and he'll prophesy, and then he'll get up and leave and go hide in his hotel room. You know, that's a whole different understanding mm -hmm. of ministry than we hear much about. But those are the deep places of the Lord. If you really want to be used of God in miracles, there is a, a cross you must carry, a cross you must bear. Now, Catherine Kuhlman, I know this is why she did it, because he was all she had. She didn't have anything else. And she would say to her audience, please don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't you know he's all I have? That's because she walked in this. That's the realm of the miracles. That's what he's bringing the Shulamite to. I'll say one more time. A lovesick person works better and is more dedicated than a worker any day. A fascinated person with Jesus doesn't sin very well. Oh, we can sin, but it's miserable. Oh, we're miserable. <laughs> people until we get right with God. We don't enjoy sinning anymore. Now, Apostle Paul, I mean John, here we are looking at John the Baptist, and um, he talked about decreasing. He talked about letting the Lord increase in you, and he was doing it in reference to the bridegroom. When he says, the friend of the bridegroom listens to the door, and you know what that meant? When the bridegroom was on his honeymoon and he was consummating his marriage, he didn't want everybody listening. So he'd pick like the best man, the friend of the bridegroom, and he'd listen on the door. And when the deed was done, he'd say, all right. And he'd go tell the wedding feast people, which lasted eight days, it's done, they're official, you know. That's the kind of intimacy he's talking about. And he said, I need to decrease that he might increase. I'm just the messenger, okay. That's kind of the... the scenario that uh, John the Baptist was talking about. It says, let Jesus increase and you will become bored with the things that draw you away from him. So all this stuff that captures our attention, these distractions, 
if we become more lovesick with him and we decrease and he increases, then we literally become bored with other stuff in our world. It's not like we have to give up. It's like we're free to be holy. We're free from the desires of it. I don't have any desire to go around town sleeping with men in bars. None whatsoever. You know, I'm free from all that because I am lovesick with him. And you will find freedom in the issues and the, the places of your life. Uh, but some people, that's what they live for. You know, that one little thing. And it's quite sad, actually. John chapter 1 tells us, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Or others say, did not overcome it. I think it's interesting that when a light shines in a room, it overpowers the darkness. It doesn't take a lot of light to light up a whole room of darkness. So if you want to remove the darkness from your room, you don't take buckets that are full of darkness and empty them. <laughs> what you do is you shine a light into the darkness and it drives it out. Okay, so let there be light. I've been praying that, that this week, praying that over my body, over all the organs in my body. Let there be light. Let there be the creative resurrection force of God in me. So the way to remove darkness from our hearts is not by focus, focusing on our darkness, but by focusing on the light. Once you've repented, let it go. Cast it into a sea of forgetfulness. Focus on the re-feeling that we might, in, we might decrease and he automatically increases in us and all the darkness. Shed, it just fades away. In the light of his glorious face. <laughs> so here we have the bride's ministry, ministry to the daughters. It was actually orchestrated by the Holy Spirit to help her refocus on the splendor of Christ. So even in her weakness, she's focusing on him. She's rehearsing who Jesus is and how he's actually empowered her in the midst of this terrible place she's in. The occasion to speak of Christ brought pleasure and satisfaction to the soul in her great trial and affliction. I know that when I've been down, I would pull this passage out. I would sing it to the Lord. And by the time I was through with the passage, my spirit had been lifted up out of myself. I spent my time adoring him. And as you're going to see, that's the way to ravish the heart of the Lord. That will be next week's lesson. But she's also getting lifted up out of her burden by adoring him. In speaking of him personally, these attributes, Lord, you're strong, you're, you're so beautiful, your, your locks are like wavy black locks. She's adoring him and she's actually refusing to allow her heart to get hard and offended. Uh, I knew a young girl one time whose high school boyfriend crushed her heart, which often happens in high school. It's that first love and you lose it and you think you'll never live through it. And she was a worshiper, an immature believer, but a worshiper. And she would even sneak up in the middle of the night and play worship. And I asked her, are you okay? And she'd say, I refuse to let my heart harden. She would worship through the pain. And she came out of that shining like gold. She was able to forgive. She was able to move on. She didn't live in that in for 10 years of her life. She worshiped her way through the pain. The beauty of the Lord in the midst of the pain, it will set you free to minister and to uh, really meditate on the beauty of the Lord. His mercy is seen in this. It gives an opportunity for the bride to speak about her Lord. And during these times of dryness, we really must imitate the wisdom of the bride. We, we've got to learn these lessons. These are not just good stories. But we recall the excellency of Jesus Christ, the, the history that he's created with us. And we revive our own heart. We revive our affection. We don't let our heart grow cold and bitter. We, we bring out his personality in our worship. And it brings out who we are. And it's, it's beautiful that even though Jesus has been silent, this whole time he's been silent, she's endured the dark night of her soul. She's continued, he continued to be quiet, but the body of Christ was watching her. That's where she is in this season. She's alone, she's left, she's painful because she's lovesick and he's so silent and he's watching and the body of Christ is like, who is this that you would 
still worship him in such love sickness after that he's done all this to you. Well, that's where we're going to end today. And next week, we will find out how the Lord feels about his bride in this season. So God bless you all. Take care.